media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Steve Soretsky. He's a Vancouver-based realtor online at SteveSoretsky.com. He's speaking to us from Vancouver. Welcome back to the show, Steve. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Steve, uh, first of all, can you just tell us a little bit about the Steve Soretsky report? Is it out yet? Uh, yeah, just uh, we publish it every month, and it's just a detailed analysis of the Vancouver housing market. It's usually like 20 pages or so, uh, so you can get that for free at stevesoretsky.com. Uh, again, it just comes out every month. So, What are the latest sales prices and listing numbers for March? Yeah, well, we had record record sales obviously in uh in greater vancouver here in march so you know for surpassing the 2016 housing bull market and obviously if every, anybody remembers you know march of 2016 which was our previous record high for sales um you know that was kind of coincided with peak foreign investment into the housing market here uh you know it was a raging bull market we had crazy stories of houses selling you know a million dollars over the ask and you know wasn't uncommon to see 10, 15, 20 offers in a house. So the fact that we're hitting, you know, these sales numbers, uh, today in an environment where, you know, there's really not a whole lot of fundamentals supporting it. Uh, obviously, you know, very little to no population growth, uh, very little foreign investment because there's no travel and at the same time, obviously a weaker labor market. So, um, that's pretty impressive. Um, at the same time, we have, you know, new listings also hitting record highs. Uh, in March, so you know, up 86 percent from last year, uh, which indicates to me, you know, despite contra- contrary to what the media and these big bank economists are reporting, this notion that well, people aren't listing their house because of the pandemic, and there's this pent up wave of sellers is completely false. What you're actually seeing is new listings have actually been running um, near record highs for the last, you know. For, for most of the pandemic, really. Um, so people are moving, basically is what this tells me, is you have record sales and you have record new listings. People are moving all over the place, obviously because their lives have been upended um, during this pandemic, right? So, And you can see that in the rental market, too. There's an excessive amount of turnover uh, in the rental market. Again, people are just moving for various reasons. So um, that's kind of the, the market as a whole. I would just call it, it is the great reshuffling. People are moving. How much have home prices risen since the beginning of all this? Well, I mean, I guess it depends on how you measure it. I mean, I think that um, the the way that the, the real estate board measures it is through the home price index. The reality is that home price index is a lagging indicator. Uh, it's a hedonically adjusted metric that smooths out uh, volatility. Uh, and so what happens is it tends to lag by three to six months. Um, so if you look at it today, it suggests that detached home prices are up 18% from last year, um, when in reality I would say they're probably closer to 25%. And then you've got the condo market, which suggests it's up 4%, when again I'd say it's probably up uh, you know, 8 to 10%. Now, we heard the Bank of Montreal blaming the Bank of Canada for this uh, latest real estate mania. What were they complaining about? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't think they're wrong. I think that they were complaining, obviously, about the, the um, you know, severe forward guidance um, where the Bank of Canada is basically coming out and telling Canadians that, you know, you should go borrow a whole bunch of money uh, to buy a house or a new car and basically ensuring Canadians that rest assured we will keep interest rates pinned to zero until at least 2023, uh, and, and interest rates will stay low for a very, very long time. That's their words, not mine. 
Uh, and so obviously I think when you tell people that, well, people say, holy smokes, you know, I can borrow money at one and a half percent for the next five years. Obviously that encourages people to, to jump into the housing market. I mean, the reality is, is uh, a mortgage rate at 1.5 is a, it's, it's a real negative interest rate. I mean, inflation, I would argue is, is a minimum 2% and the real inflation is probably much higher than that. So, you know, you're, you're locking in the cost of money below the rate of inflation. So it's a real negative interest rate. So I think that it, it certainly encouraged a lot of people into the housing market. It's, cur- it's encouraging a lot of, um, demand to be pulled forward how do sales and prices now compare to the top in 2016 uh, i mean everything's higher the only thing that i would say is not higher is is your your high-end luxury housing market so you know if you're looking for a, a four million dollar house in, in west vancouver you know it's arguably still cheaper than uh you know 2016 same thing on you know vancouver's west side some of these very high-end homes are still not quite at the levels that where they were in 2016, but the reality is, is most people, particularly locals here in Vancouver, uh, are not playing in that sector. And if you're looking for an entry level house, an entry level townhouse, or a condo, or what have you, prices are up significantly from 2016 or 2017 highs. Um, and so, you know, that's I think that's ultimately what matters for most people. Are rising mortgage rates starting to affect the housing market? Uh, not really. Uh, I mean, obviously if we look at March sales, you know, there's a bit of a lag with, with mortgage rate stuff. I mean, I do think that naturally the housing market should slow. I mean, we've had record sales here in March. It's going to be very hard to continue that pace regardless of what mortgage rates are doing. Um, and so I th- I do think that, you know, naturally when rates move from one and a half percent at the bottom here to where they are today at 2.2, uh, you know, as they start creeping up to two, three, two, four, two, five, I do think you're going to see uh, a slowdown in sales activity. Is there a, a certain mortgage rate you think that would put a stop to this? Some people said, well, you know, in other uh, real estate booms, mortgage rates were quite a bit higher, and yet people were buying. Uh, would 3% do it? Is it 5%, 7%? I mean, I don't know what the numbers are right now for actual mortgages, but is there kind of a a stop, uh, almost a stop loss number like you would have on a stock? Uh, I mean, I don't know. I think like as you start to hit that three percent um, barrier, at least from like a psychological perspective, I feel like three percent is kind of a, a number to keep an eye on. I mean, this is just me sort of pontificating, so it's not obviously a perfect <laughs> science or anything, but. Um, you know, I think remember back in 2018, you know, mortgage rates hit three and a half percent and the housing market basically came to a standstill. So, and everybody thought they were going to go from three and a half up to four percent. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of people sitting on the sidelines waiting for prices to correct and they did correct a little bit. Um, and as it was, you know, as soon as the market started selling off, obviously, you know, we had central bankers coming back in, um, with, you know, uh, by basically cutting rates and doing a whole bunch of whole bunch more of QE, so you know I think that if the market starts to sell off because you have rates around three percent, obviously I think that central banks are probably inclined to step back into the housing market or, or not in the housing market, but just the, the financial markets. What is the Bank of Canada doing? Uh, I mean, they're still maintaining their you know four billion dollars of of QE per week, um, you know, keeping rates at zero. I mean, they now own, as of today, they own 40%, 40% of the entire government of Canada bond market. So, you know, they play a massive role in supporting finance, uh, financial conditions. Um, so again, obviously, you know, even the, the ability to borrow today at 2.2% on your mortgage, um, uh, is a direct result of the Bank of Canada's intervention. We'll have more with Steve Soretsky right after this. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon, trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. 
Welcome back. We're speaking with Steve Swetsky. Steve, are the big banks getting nervous about the housing market? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously they've, they've come out, you know, um, in the, in the media and, and in a lot of the reports right, lately, you know, flagging the housing market, asking for government intervention. Obviously, you know, I have to laugh because the reality is, 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 you know, one way to solve, if you're worried about the housing market, you know, the excess, excess froth, obviously, all, all you have to do is curb your lending. And uh, that'll change things pretty quick. But I understand from the bank's perspective, you've got, you know, shareholders and, and board members, et cetera, et cetera, that, you know, you can't just start cutting your cutting your lending and giving up market share to your competitors. It's not necessarily an easy conversation to have, again, with the shareholders. So as a publicly traded company, uh, obviously, they're looking for the government to come in and to make regulatory changes um, so, you know, they can kind of justify uh, you know, curbing some lending or, you know, along those lines, right? So nobody wants to give up market share. I get it. Uh, and so I think they're looking for policymakers to do that. And obviously they just did. Uh, Aussie has now proposed increasing the mortgage stress test for uninsured mortgages. Um, so I think that's going to go into to effect almost certainly uh, for June 1st. Now, that stress test didn't exist in the past. It's a relatively recent invention. Has it slowed sales down, or is there a kind of a pent-up demand? For six months, we had deferred mortgages. Are people using that deferred mortgage money to purchase new real estate? And and if they are, then these uh, tougher rules really won't matter much, will they? I mean, I think they still matter to the market. I mean, you could argue that, you know, home prices are up 17% nationally. I mean, maybe without the stress test, they'd be up 25. I mean, it's hard to say, but uh, I do think any time you put a, you know, uh, a cap on, on borrowing power, um, you know, that will ultimately slow price acceleration. So, you know, I think that certainly the, the mortgage deferral program, um, for all intents and purposes, as it was designed, was a success. Um, but, you know, there's, obviously we can get to the repercussions of that, but, you know, it was designed as a success. We had certainly, uh, what, what was a economic downturn could have been a lot more painful. So we kind of avoided that. Um, and obviously, yes, I do think that there's some people taking advantage of those programs, obviously levering up, um, and, and buying more investment properties. Do you think the upcoming federal budget, April 19th, could target real estate? Uh, I don't think so. Particularly, I mean, I know everybody's trying to speculate on it, but the reality is, if you look at it from a policymaker's perspective, every single metric or every single policy they've brought in um, over the past 12 months has basically been designed to, you know, spur uh, credit creation. It's been designed to, you know, create an economic recovery, and it's pretty obvious that the economic recovery. Um, is leaning heavily on the housing market. Policymakers have gone back to the housing market uh, in an attempt to boost that activity in order to spur the economic recovery. Again, I know there's repercussions for that. The fact is affordability is obviously getting worse. You're, you're, you're creating larger and larger debt loads, and so those are going to be repercussions down the road. But for me, uh, at least from what I can see what policymakers are doing, is that they are just trying to get through this pandemic slash you know economic contraction and housing really is the backbone of that recovery right now we keep hearing the idea of a capital gains tax on the sale of your principal residence do you think ottawa will go through with that i don't i i mean i think if they do some form of that they could, they could probably i mean the reality is, is you got a 69 percent home ownership rate in canada so to target 69 percent of your voter base to me seems suicidal uh, in terms of a political perspective. Do I think that they could frame it and target, you know, the wealthy investor or the wealthy speculator? Could they bring an attack where it says, hey, you know, we're going to cap capital gains at, or, you know, principal exemption at, you know, a million bucks, something along those lines? Possibly. I, I still think it's highly unlikely. Well, of course, we're asking for rational behavior from the government. Remember, it's the government we're talking about. Could we be looking at a real estate market comparable to the early 80s? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't have too much thought on that. I think that, uh, you know, rates are low. Obviously, hey, if rate, rates rates go up, you know, 
uh, in the late eighties, we had that correction, right? So, I mean, if I, I think that, I don't think there's a whole lot of room to run. I mean, I think we've, we're going to see. Yeah, it's already baked into the cake. Obviously, just the way that these home price indexes are recorded, that you will see record house price acceleration. I think nationally in the next three to four months. Um, so you'll see massive acceleration nationally in home prices. So we'll probably hit record highs there. But uh, I think that you know uh, we've pulled a lot of demand forward. So I'm not I'm not really anticipating you know, a significant boom necessarily from here. I, I think that the, the, the financial conditions are very easy and they will be easy for the next several years. So I'm not really anticipating any major crash or correction, um, but I do think that um, things will probably likely cool off here. We'll have more with Steve Soretsky right after this. Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlin, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Steve Soretsky. Steve, how many months of inventory are in the various areas of the Lower Mainland? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the... Uh... I mean, I'm, I just measure Greater Vancouver as a whole. So if we measure Greater Vancouver as a whole for the, you know, detached housing market, um, you're at, I believe, 1.8 months of supply for sale. So again, you know, it's important to just to make this distinction because when you say, you know, we've got record sales and record new listings, people go, well, what, what does that mean? You know, we've got a lot of listings, we've got a lot of sales. So what does that mean? So it's always important to look at the months of inventory because that's going to basically tell you where prices are heading. Um, and so when you have 1.8 months of supply in the detached housing market, that implies extremely tight conditions. That implies higher prices. So that's where that market is. Now, if you look at the condo market, um, you know, <clears throat> policymakers, particularly the Bank of Canada, keep coming out and saying, oh, you know, not, not, not too much to worry about. It's mostly just, you know, it's a consumer preference shift into the detached housing market. The majority of the strength is concentrated there. You know, just look at the condo market. And, you know, that might have been true if you're looking in the rearview mirror. I mean, if you look at the months of inventory in the condo space, between June to November, the months of inventory was hovering around four months of supply. Uh, four months of supply typically indicates a softer market. Um, we now have months of inventory in the condo space down to 1.5. So the condo market is actually tighter today than the single-family housing market, yet the single-family housing market continues to get all the media attention. Um, we're actually beginning to see, in my opinion, uh, the condo market playing catch-up to the detached housing market. Um, so yes, condo prices are only up 4% year-over-year, but if you look on a month-over-month basis, they just accelerated 2.5% from February to March, So, and you've got one and a half months of supply in the market for sale. So to me... Um, the runway for the condo market is higher. Are people now looking at condos simply because there's the real estate chain? You usually buy the most affordable thing you can to get into real estate, build up your equity, and move higher. The average Canadian, you know, buys four homes in their lifetime. Is that what's going on? People are seeing, well, if I want to get into this uh, whole real estate game, I have to start somewhere and condos would be it. Yeah, I think that um, I think that's definitely what we're seeing. It's just people just in a, a bit of, in a bit of a panic just to get secure something. And I think obviously there's been a lot of people that have been priced out of the single family and then the townhouse markets, um, which have been the, the leaders uh, in terms of price growth. And so now you're seeing a lot more investors also jumping back into the fray, and that's pushing condo prices higher. Um, yeah, but I think ultimately it's following a similar trajectory to 2000. You know, the 2016 housing boom, if anyone remembers, like, single family, for the most part, peaked in the spring of 2016. And then after that, it was the condo market that took off. I think, 
you know, 2017, I think condo prices went up 30%, um, while the single family market stagnated slash basically went down. So, uh, you know, in my opinion, I think this is following a very similar trajectory. The single family market's up, you know, 25 to 30%, depending on the area. And the condo market's pretty much been, you know, very flat price growth. So, uh, yeah, I do think that the condo market will probably be the leader here over the next 12 months while the single family market uh, slows down. What do you think has caused the fear of missing out bidding? Uh, well, I just think obviously it's rampant price acceleration, right? When you people see prices accelerating by, again, I mean, let's just say 20 to 25% uh in in parts of the market again 30 percent in the suburbs that um you know i hear it all the time i hear it all the time from people that have been that basically get priced out right i mean if you think about the average person the local person that's earning let's say a hundred thousand dollars a year like you know when you have a when you have a 1.5 million dollar asset move 25 percent you know your your income's not keeping up with that so, the, you know, the timing of that, you know, it's a much different when a $400,000 house goes up 20%. You know, it's not the end of the world. But when you have a million and a half dollar asset go up 20%, I mean, those are significant numbers. Uh, and people start to get priced out pretty quickly. So um, I think that's what's driving a lot of this, uh, you know, panic. Are people waiting for COVID to end before listing their homes for sale? No. I mean, obviously we touched about this uh, at the beginning of the show. But again, if you look at new listings, again, they've been running abnormally high uh, for seven or eight months now. So, you know, people were scared about listing their home for sale, you know, March, April, May of 2020. But the reality is, is there's I, I haven't run into anybody that says I'm scared of listing my house. Everybody knows the protocol. We've been through this pandemic now for a year. Uh, and people are just accustomed to it. It's just a way of life now. So, uh, and if you look at the, the number of new listings, it suggests otherwise. Is selling over c- current asking price the norm and could it continue? Uh, I mean, it's been the norm, obviously, during this bull market. I mean, single family housing, for example, you have 55% of homes that are selling above the asking price. That's the highest percentage since the spring of 2016. So again, we are sort of raising alarm bells or red flags that, you know, the single family market is on a lot of metrics hitting these highs that we last saw at the 2016 peak. So it feels to me like if we're not at the peak, we're getting awfully close to it. Um, and, uh, you know, what you tend to see is obviously these bidding wars create rapidly rising house prices uh but at the same time people buyers eventually get discouraged they get sick and tired of competing sick and tired of losing out in multiple offers and eventually um they just shift to the sidelines and then you have more opportunistic sellers trying to take advantage of these really high prices and so you know that's that's ultimately the cure for, for house prices right high house prices cure high house prices have mortgages being financed at lower rates along with appreciation in the price of homes led to increased consumer debt and the boom in real estate, automobiles, and the financial markets? I mean, there's definitely been a lot of refinancing. You talk to, to mortgage brokers here across Canada, um, you know, especially people that are in financial difficulty. Um, you know, not only has your house price gone up, but your mortgage rate has come down so this has created a very opportune time for people to refinance and it's certainly spurring uh i think more consumption you mentioned in your podcast at steve that you've been buying a property a month for the past few months what kind of properties have you been buying and in what areas yeah i mean i think we should preface that like obviously you know there's there's sort of my own personal holdings and i have Investments that I run with with uh, various business partners, so it's not certainly all all me, all cash. I'm not levering myself to the hilt if anybody <laughs> has that sort of perception. But uh, you know, we purchased uh, a couple units downtown. I think that uh, you know the whole notion of downtown selling off and and being sort of 
the end of the world, nobody going back to the office, uh, was completely overblown. Um, you know, when you see single family house prices in the suburbs going up 30% and the condo market downtown, you know, falling five to 10%, to me, I thought there was a decent arbitrage there. And it certainly see, certainly sees or feels like, you know, if you look at the data, um, that, uh, you know, that's, that's working out for us. I think that, um, you know, the condo market downtown, uh, you know, one bedroom is now under 600,000. Every single one of them is multiple offers today. So, you know, that market's changed significantly as people I think realize that offices will be coming back online um, and I think that the other opportune space I'm typically not a fan of as I think that the pre-sale market has been offering some pretty good opportunities I think those opportunities are slowing a bit so for example um, developers particularly for condos were selling you know some of these projects out um, selling some of these projects basically at or below market value, um, and they don't complete till 2023, 2024. So if your view is that prices will be are, are going to go up, you know it's kind of like a free call option or a futures contract. So you're kind of locking in today's price, and in three or four years, you know you're going to have that contract delivered to you. So uh, you know that's a, that was an interesting opportunity. Um, you know we've had our clients as well. You know, look at, for example, there was at the big, at the onset, there was, you know, that, that not so much anymore, but what we saw was townhouses, for example, were very, very, very hot in the resale market. Again, those prices are up about 25%. Every single townhouse in the resale market was going multiple offers, even the bad ones. Uh, and so we had some of our clients going away. Hold on a minute. This developer down the road is selling townhouses that are yes they're not yet constructed but they'll be done in 12 months and i can pay a reasonable price and not have any sort of competition no bidding wars you know no emotional buyers bidding up the prices to sky high levels so again that offered a pretty good um i think opportunity i I mean now we're seeing obviously developers going oh oops and they're now raising their prices Uh, i mean we had clients where they literally literally secured townhouses out in the suburbs uh, in Coquitlam and, um, you know, three, three weeks after they bought, we were one of the first buyers in there. Three weeks after they bought, the developers raised the prices of a hundred thousand dollars in every single unit, uh, because they realized that they were underselling these things. The market was moving at a rapid pace. Is the Vancouver condo market different downtown Vancouver? Because it's a city that's always had a large residential population most large cities after five o'clock in the afternoon become ghost towns. Vancouver with uh, the West End and Yale Town and other developments. Is it a a different attitude towards condos in Vancouver than perhaps anywhere else in the world? Uh, Except maybe Hong Kong. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think that obviously it's always more desirable to have, you know, a single family house and your own plot of land and have control over the assets but i think the reality is is that you know in the city of vancouver right i mean houses now start at you know your entry level house is 1.6 so the reality is is that everything's going to move i think strata over the next 10 years and so it's just kind of you know people are accustomed to it it's similar to like manhattan you know like you just unless you're really 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 well off i mean most people are going to be buying strata condos and townhouses so um you know i think that's just just kind of the norm it's just what it is considering the continued push for the great reset and agenda 2030 where apparently you'll not own anything and be happy about it is real estate ownership a good idea i mean yeah i mean obviously i think that real estate is you know certainly you're asking a realtor here so you know i'm sure the audience will have a good good chuckle on that but i mean i think that you know, it doesn't have to be Vancouver real estate necessarily, but I think if you look at real estate historically, uh, as, as a, as a storeholder of value and as a, a creator or a builder of wealth, I mean, I think it's kind of proven its, uh, worth over, you know, centuries. So, you know, I think that real estate, while yes, it might look overvalued and it probably is in, in a lot of cases, um, I think that it will, it'll continue over a long duration to be a, a strong holder of, 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 of wealth. Are you seeing any signs of the real estate market topping? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, I think like when we talk about the single family market, when you have prices moving 30% in 12 months, I mean, you're going to have a pullback. Um, whether that pullback's, you know, just a slowing off, whether that's a 5 to 10% correction, uh, I would not be surprised in the next 12 to 18 months if, if prices were, were, you know, had corrected by say 10%. Um, that would not surprise me. I think that again, a lot of our in- indicators suggest that the market is extremely frothy and, and, and toppy. And I think that we're seeing early signs, uh, you know, very, very early signs that the market is slowing. So if, for example, you know, you go from, you know, you know, the typical house was getting eight offers and now you're getting four offers and, and, you know, maybe four offers turns into two offers and two offers turns into, you know, no offers, right? So, and then you start reducing the prices. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's very early signs, but I think there's certainly evidence of it. Do topping real estate markets usually coincide with topping stock markets? I mean, I think what we're seeing today is a lot of asset classes are moving in tandem, right? I mean, that's just the reality. When you have every, you know, major central bank in the world, you know, slashing interest rates down to zero and, and printing a whole bunch of money uh, through these massive QE programs, uh, you know, we tend to find that most asset classes now are moving in tandem. So, uh, you know, I can't say for sure that that's going to be the case, but I think that, Yes, typically speaking, you're seeing like you look to look around today. I mean, yeah, real estate's at all time highs here, but you know, so is the stock market. Uh, you know, so is uh, you know, Bitcoin and 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 gold. Obviously, you know, yes, it's sold off, but we were off record highs uh, not too long ago here. How does the housing market look when measured in gold? Yeah, this is just kind of like a fun, fun example we put in the threat report for for this month. Um, you know, just important to measure because I think like what's happening is, you know, everybody says, wow, look at house prices. They're going up. Well, there's not a whole lot of fundamentals, but you know, is it, is, are the house prices really going up or is the currency simply being devalued? I mean, obviously we can look at the central bank here in Canada and say, wow, these guys are sure printing a lot of money. I mean, they own 40% of the bond market now and they're, you know, doing $4 billion of QE. Like, you know, maybe the currency is being devalued. So it's funny because when you actually look at, you know, if you're if you're looking at the house price index in Greater Vancouver, it is at record high. So prices have never been higher. However, if you then divide that home price index into ounces of gold, for example, uh, it actually it actually costs fewer takes it requires fewer ounces of gold today to purchase the typical home in Greater Vancouver than it did you know 10, 15 years ago. So, you know, again, it's just a, it's just way, a different way of looking at things that, you know, it's less so about, again, the house price going up and it's more so that the currency is, is actively being devalued. Are property taxes basically land rent that you pay to your municipal government? Uh, yeah, I mean, for sure it is. What about Vancouver's position where we're seeing owners of one and two story properties being taxed as if they had a 72 story tower there. They're taxing the air above your head. Is that a good policy on the city's part? What are they trying to prove? Uh, I mean, I don't like it. I think it's a stupid policy, but I mean, I'm not necessarily surprised. I think that uh, real estate is, you know, the one thing I say, you know, if you want to make a bearish argument for, for real estate, um, is that I do think it's going to be, you know, the, it's going to be the eye of the tax man. I think that you're going to see more and more taxes against real estate slowly and surely. Uh, it's a very easy to tax. Obviously, it's a uh, immovable, illiquid asset. So it's very easy to tax and people have made a lot of money on it. So, you know, governments, you know, they talk about housing affordability, but let's not fool ourselves. I mean, the majority of their revenues or a good chunk of their revenues at least uh, are for, from the real estate, uh, sector. So I think that uh, they are certainly benefiting as well uh, from higher prices here. Does government red tape stop the building of affordable housing? Uh, I mean, I think that they're certainly a huge part of the problem. I and mean, if you look again here in, in the lower mainland, I mean, it takes, you know, to get a high rise, you know, done from start to finish. I mean, you're looking at a seven year project, right? So um, you know, three, three, three years of that alone is just get through city approvals. So, um, you know, they're a huge hindrance and obviously, 
their, uh, you know, all their taxation, um, you know, around that, right? I mean, every every year that you have to hold a property because you're trying to get through city approval, every year it's just a, you know, holding cost that ultimately gets passed on to the buyer. Uh, at the same time, you have, you know, CAC, all these taxes, you know, all the, all the red tape. Like, it costs money to get uh, to get these permits and to get these approvals. And so, you know, a lot of that, again, just gets ultimately passed on to the end users. So, you know, when you talk about housing affordability, I think governments are certainly part of the problem. Steve, what's the best way for people to get in contact with you? Uh, yeah, the best way is just by email. So it's steve at Um Yeah, I can try to get back to you in a timely matter, obviously. And, uh, you know, if you're looking for more up-to-date information, I'm pretty active on Twitter at Steve Suretsky. Steve, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. My guest has been Steve Soretsky, Vancouver-based realtor online at stevesoretsky.com and as you heard, also on Twitter at Steve Soretsky. If you have any questions for Steve or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com, our YouTube channel, Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at How Street. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.